Hello, my brothers and sisters in Christ and those who do not know Christ, because you're still my brothers and sisters. My name's Nikki Brazel, and I came today to share about deliverance. Um, if you've received Christ, you may already have a feeling that you've been delivered, or maybe you're unsure, or maybe you've been in the church a long time, and so you know Christ, but maybe you're feeling unseated right now with what's going on in the world and just in your own country. Of course, I'm in the United States, and so this word is for everybody, but especially for my brothers in the United, my brothers and sisters in the United States. So the first thing I want to ask you, um, and if you don't fall into any of these categories, then I guess you could just scroll on past, but I would encourage you to not. So I would just want to ask you a question. Um, well, you know what? I'm going to tell you, these are things that I have overcome through Christ, that Christ has brought me through, that I was even unaware that I was suffering under them. So I just really had, I, I, you know, I went to church. I thought that, you know, I was a Christian and I believed myself to be saved, but of course not perfect. And so this message really is for, I don't have a better phrase than what I will call middle of the road Christians. So these Christians tend to go to church. You know, they have a regular church. Maybe they help out of the church. Maybe they don't. Um, they might post different scriptures sometimes on the on you know on the word maybe on their social media platform, maybe not missionaries or someone who's given up their whole life to serve the Lord, but they they, they have received Christ, but they are still beholden to the world's systems and what the world says. So the first thing I want to say is the majority of the churches, the 501c churches, are false, and so this is the reason why the the church, the true church of God is not trained and ready in this hour and I'm of course going to explain all this and I really wanted this video to be short and I've gone back and forth in my mind about how can I make it short because people's time is so so valuable and they, they have their attention drawn to so many different things you know with the elections and pandemic and just all kind of stuff so but I really wanted to but at this point I, I know it can't be short I have to explain the whole thing and I want to and so I pray in Jesus mighty name that it bless you and I know it will deliver you I know God will use this for deliverance because that's what he's shown me because he used the circumstances in my life to deliver me okay so that's the first thing if you've been told as a Christian you know there's no suffering for Christ that's a lie of the enemy and I want you to dismiss it all suffering is is valuable because it leads us closer to Christ so I just we're gonna start out from here and you know, it's taken a long time for the Lord to convince me that He creates each one of us with a purpose and a story to share with the with the body of Christ. And also, it took Him a long time to just bring me all through this. Well, I won't say it took Him a long time. He's 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 not slack concerning His children. It took me a long time, but according to God, it's His perfect timing. Everything works in His perfect timing, and I believe Him. So, if you're looking for deliverance, and if you want to walk out the real truth of Christ, it, which is happiness in any circumstance and if you really want to understand maybe some things that have happened to you and this is going to be to help you springboard a conversation with Christ okay springboard deliverance so first of all I want to tell you the things that God's delivered me from and I'm sure there's a lot more but this is just he asked me to make a list of just like the main ones I don't I don't even know if these are the main ones but I'm sure I've missed some but here we go these are the these are the things I have been delivered for that I suffered under my whole life irritated can't forgive feelings of being dismissed a dismissed feeling by others um, a lack of fo focus on relationships um, early childhood trauma destructive learning environments so I just say so, you know I my father my father was in the military and we traveled a lot and I had several destructive learning environments in my childhood and my dad also was a military so he, he wasn't great at helping us with homework. So God bless him. I love my dad. God rest his soul. Um, I struggle with feelings of unworthiness. Um, I've been delivered from that. Um, distraction, anger, frustration, guilt, or the need to fill an empty space with other things. So activities, you know, being busy. Um, remorse, anxiety, stress, workaholism. I used to work 140 hours a week, if you could believe that. Feelings of being used or taken uh, for granted. Those can be really hard. Abuse, uh, feeling unloved, condemnation, underappreciated. And I'm sure that falls under <laughs> taken for granted, but I noticed I wrote it down again. So that was something that I, that I really had struggled with. Feelings of complete exasperation as, um, as the enemy made every effort to just convince me 
I had to be self-reliant. So feelings of self-reliance, but the feelings that also came with that, the stress, the anxiety, just, just feeling exasperated in general with the world, the consequences, not knowing what was coming at me, things coming at me from all directions and just handling them the best that I could, uh, but definitely stressing me out. Sorry, you guys, got some hair in my face. Um, incorrect doctrine, I did, was unaware that I was under incorrect doctrine. Um, I had rage at circumstances beyond my control. And when I say rage, I just mean like th that anger that you just, oh, you just, you can't, you know, you're just screaming at God. Um, lack of discernment, naivety. I, I, I've been accused of being naive in my life, and I definitely think that's true. Um, I over have, the Lord has helped me to overcome forlorn, being feeling forlorn, unloved, and not knowing my purpose, which is really the reason why all these other feelings can come in. Um, feeling unloved, and I just really couldn't understand my purpose. Um, not being able to receive the Father's love fully, and. A lot of people think they have received Christ all the way, but they, they haven't received his love fully because it, you can tell it in their behavior and their treatment of other people. You know, I was a prime example. Guilty as charged. Um, uh, let's see. I have a, oh, oh, unseemly fights with God. I have, have, have hollered and yelled at God so much in the last, you know, probably four or five years, maybe even 10 years, you know, just really screamed at him and been like, what is going on here? Um, internal conflict. I've overcome a lot of internal conflict. Uh, basic irritation at just how things are. So a bad attitude. Um, I don't know that other people would maybe know that about me, but definitely my close family. You know, I would definitely suffer from a bad attitude when I just consequences or circumstances were not what I thought they should be. I definitely had an attitude about it. Um, I I also overcame the loss of a best friend at a pivotal moment in my life. Um, I've overcome the death of my daughter at my son's hand and the subsequent life imprisonment of my son, teenager. Um, I overcame through Christ, all these things through Christ, an angry, bitter divorce. My first marriage was not approved by God and it was an angry, bitter divorce. Um, I've overcome some health challenges that I've had, especially in the last few years that were really rough on me. Despair, utter, complete despair and contempt for my situation, just, just total contempt. Uh, mortal grief. <laughs> I actually, this one, mortal grief, I was listing these out and the Holy Spirit was like mortal grief. And I thought, mortal grief, wouldn't that be that you died? You know, being me. And the Holy Spirit was like, well, there was that one time you didn't eat for 20, 25 days, 24 days um, through grief. So I guess that could be mortal grief. You know, I'm not, I'm neither a foodie and love to eat or don't eat. I don't have any food issues, but I was in mortal grief because I just refused to eat or drink for almost a whole month. I was just like, I mean, I didn't tell anybody. I just wasn't going to. Uh, desperation, utter desperation, angst, continual angst through through things people said, people, things people were doing, just, just all of it. Now, um, self-righteousness. I was delivered from self-righteousness. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Ambiguity about my place and ambiguity about my relationship with Christ. Um, empty, distracted, and unfulfilled. And then this says, okay, feeling like I had an endless well for others, but there wasn't somewhere for me to refill my cup. These are, I want to make sure, oh, captivity. I felt very chained, you know, about my, in my life. I felt very chained and captive. Like I just couldn't really live in freedom or happiness. And um, let's see, heavy depression throughout different different seasons. So that that's the bulk of it. I don't need to go over the list. So Maybe you have other things. There could be, you know, some serious uh, things that you're facing. But I want to speak to what I'm going to call the middle of the road Christian, just because that's what I considered myself. You know, I and so I want to speak to you because it's very possible you call yourself a Christian, but you still are suffering under these these types of things or different things. And so I'm here to try to explain what's going on with you, why you're still suffering over things and how to get delivered from them because it's actually it's 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 not a difficult process the father says that all who call on me will be saved but what we're not understanding is is that there's a process there's a process for everything and of course because god works in his own time so the first thing i want to tell you is i would never have thought that i was of course i wouldn't have thought it that i was self-righteous but of course my middle of the road christianity did give me a sense of self-righteousness now i wasn't a gossip or really like looking down on other people I didn't think like verbally or outside of my own 
I didn't feel like my actions were that way. But in truth, one of the one of the first things that I, God has shown me through this is that a lot of Christians don't realize that they're holding unforgiveness. Uh, they have contempt, slight contempt for other people that they see as sinners, maybe alcoholics, drug addicts, murderers, abusers, what, whatever the, the list goes on. Because as for, for his church, his church that's asleep, a lot of them think like there's levels of sin. They just are very convinced of that. And I myself, I think that I was convinced of that too, in the sense, because I felt like I was a pretty good person. So um, I'll give you a little background here, history. I was raised in the church as a smaller child, and my parents, of course, brought two different types of faith to the, to the, to the marriage. But I know that when I was very, very young, we were in a true church that taught true doctrine. But by the time I was 11, 10 or 11, the church had just really changed. Churches had changed, you know, in the, in the 70s. And really in the 70s, churches changed. And, you know, Hellfire and Brimstone was not taught anymore. And that message of Christ's love was coming forward. And, of course, you know, it's wonderful. The love of Jesus Christ is very wonderful. But it's never to be, you know, we cannot just take one attribute of God and just say, well, that's the only attribute there is. Because God is holy. And he chastises his children and he passes judgment, rightfully so. He's a righteous judge. And thank God that he does. And so here, here is my position at the time in my life when this great, this great awakening happened was I owned a company. Of course, felt very proud about that. I had built it from very small and it was very successful. Um, and of course, in my mind, that was me who had done that. I, I could, I, you know, Christians sometimes they'll say, oh, the Lord blessed me. But in truth... We, we tend to, the enemy spirit, the spirit of the Antichrist, you know, it's, it's the, the prince of the air is everywhere in the world. It tends, we tend to start getting a feeling like, well, I did this. You know, we start thinking, well, I'm good. I go to church. You know, I'm not bad like that person. And if you're honest, you've had those feelings. Maybe you, maybe you at some point in, in your day or in your month, you're saying, well, I forgave that person, but I just don't deal with them. You know, because it's, it's socially, you know, a lot of people are like, well, you can cut people out of your life. And if they're doing things to you or, you know, there's so such a social justice message that's so opposite of the message of Christ. But it's insidious. You know, it's all around us. So we're unaware that we are we're claiming this culture of this society that's not ours. And we were told very clearly to be separate, very, very clearly. And um, I have to laugh because, you know, I really didn't have so much training in this. Like, I, I didn't even know that I was wrong. I, I, I mean... I knew I didn't have like this kind of relationship that other people have with Christ. You know, they were hearing from him all the time. They would get messages. Some parts of the Bible I would read, you know, rejoice in your suffering. What? You know, you read parts of the Bible. A lot of people read parts of the Bible. I'm like, what does that mean? I don't even understand that. And until <coughs> Christ brings us through to the other side, we don't understand a lot of it because you kind of just have to go through it. So life is a process. <coughs> so I... What happens with a lot with with a lot of people? They're going through life. Things start happening. They start get a hard heart. You know, remember it says, you know, on the day of provocation, don't harden 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 not your heart against the Lord. And what that means is like, you know, when you're provoked, when these these things as Christians, we're really just supposed to go straight to Christ and and and, and ask Him what He's showing us. And He's so good because this past few years, He's just shown me so many things. So first off, I want to say I don't want to miss the opportunity. If someone is rubbing you the wrong way, either in your family or you work with them or at your church, that's a good sign that something they're doing, God wants to show you in yourself. And you need to ask him because he'll wash you from it and clean you from it. But, but as Christians, there's a lot of Christians right now that think when the rapture happens, they're going to be raptured, but they have unforgiveness in their heart. So first thing I want to speak to is the fact that God loved us so much that he sent his son to be beaten and disfigured on a cross for our sins. He that was without sin carried all the sin of the world. Now just think about that gift. And we're forgiven for all our sins. All we need is come ask and receive the son. Every sin, past, present, and future. I'm not, I'm not suggesting you go out and sin, but I need you to understand that God knows we are and he forgives us. Can you imagine what a smack in the face it is to, those, to God Almighty? Just, I want you to hold on to this. If you don't take anything else out of this, can you imagine the smack in the Father's face when He sends His Son to offer us forgiveness for everything that we've done? And then we dare hold unforgiveness in our heart for someone else. And then we dare stand on a platform where we think we will be raptured. 
and not judged for it. Does it make sense? Can you kind of see how the culture's shifting you as a Christian to get you to think the way they think, not the way our Father thinks? Okay? Maybe you are angry. Maybe you're stressed or depressed or having health concerns or any of these things, and the world has told you, well, you need to remove those people from your life, or you need to do this, or you need to do that. Here's what it is, and I'm just going to say it, and it sounds rough. You're either a saint or you ain't. My friend Rob Wood said that, and I just thought it was so funny. You're either a saint or you ain't. And it's true. You know, if you're a saint of God, then you are going to, you know, have trials and struggles, and you're going to come through them. And the reason why the Father wants us to not repay evil for evil, anger for anger, is because every single person on this planet is caught under deceit. Deceit of who they are. They're under deceit about what the powers that be are doing to keep them angry with each other. And they're under deceit about what they're capable of as a child of God. It's just total deceit. As a matter of fact, right now, there will be some Christians listening to this and they will say, no, I'm not under deceit. I'm not under deceit. I'm not deceived. If you say you're not deceived, you, you're, you lie. We, the Bible says, if you say you have no sin, you're lying. We all have sin. Every one of us. But God's so good, I want you to know that he will come in and wash it clean. But the church is lying to you if they tell you that you will not be chastised by the Father. Because the word says the Father chastises whom he loveth. So let me tell you what happened. So about four years ago, yeah, it's four years ago, I'm working, you know, I've got my job. I'm, I traveled a lot. Um, I, I taught high-end professional uh, textile design. And um, I also own, you know, a, a uh, embellishment company for golf carts and seats a, a pretty large company in Georgia and uh, my oldest daughter was 26 at the time no 24 at the time she had had been in college down at, in Georgia in southern Georgia and had moved with her fiance to Colorado she'd been there probably about four years my middle daughter who was my niece who I had adopted was in New Mexico and with her her biological mom and grandmother and um, because she wanted to be there and my son was still at home when he was 16 and Life seemed to be going good in the grand sense of the word, but of course, like other people, I, I had all these other things, you know, rage, frustration. I would get very exasperated, um, just, just feeling completely pressured. And it, it pressure I put on my own self. That's what's crazy is like I had convinced myself, you know, I need to work these hours and stuff. I, I, you know, the world does that a lot. The world just does that a lot. It's constant striving, 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 you know, even though the scriptures tell us not to. So it would seem everything's going well in my life. And if I look back, the Lord reminds me that he was gently calling me. He was kind of sending me a little message like, hey, you know, he had pulled me from the main church. My husband and I had stopped going to our main church. They had really adopted some very strange practices, you know, dancing in the main sanctuary. They were calling it like spirit dancing with like blue leotards and just it just didn't feel right. So we had stopped going to our church. We had noticed the singing and the preaching was very shallow. There was no depth. There was no depth of the word. And my, my husband is saved and knows the depth of the word. And we, we looked around for a little different church, but we just didn't feel led at that time. And I didn't feel bad about quit going to church. I Somewhere deep inside, even though I wasn't talking to the Holy Spirit, I kind of knew that God had kind of pulled me away from that because we didn't feel fulfilled there. You know, it was basically show up. Our church had opened a coffee bar and a donut place and a bookstore. And it just, that wasn't how they started out. And it was uncomfortable. And so, and, 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 God, and we knew enough about the scripture. We had enough base knowledge of some stuff that we knew we weren't being taught. So we weren't in church. And that's not a reflection on why some of this happened. I'm just trying to give you the details. You don't need to be in church. I, you know, you fellowship together. You can have a congregation of your neighbors and yourself teaching and preaching. You know, everyone is given a gift. The scripture says all the body is given a gift, all the parts. Some are apostles, some are prophets, some are teachers, some are preachers, some are exhorters, some are encouragers. You know, that's just like some people are called to be missionaries. And I knew I had never been called to do that. So I, I don't want to go too far you know, too crazy, too into detail. But again, the Lord has been very clear to me to be very specific. So at that time, I would say that I consider myself a Christian, a good person. You know, of course, I gave to charity. Um, I had never struck anyone. I didn't, wasn't a gossip. I didn't really, I wasn't rooting for people to fail. Like that was not, you know, my, my, my main thing. But I still was in very deep sin. I was not having a relationship with Christ. I was not putting him first. Obviously, working 140 hours a week is not putting God first. Um, I, I still had bouts of anger, frustration. I did it. I just 
there was so much going on, but because I had been raised in the world, I thought all those things were things I was supposed to be having. You know, of course you're supposed to be, you're, you're supposed to feel taken advantage of or taken for granted. You know, well, of course it's, you know, of course everyone's, you know, everyone's had abuse as a child. So you just, you just get angry, you get frustrated. You know, one thing that the Lord showed me in all this is my dad, he was, my dad is very, very intelligent. Both my parents have a very high IQ. And my dad was a command sergeant, command sergeant major in the military. So he trained forces and he was special forces and he had a very harsh tone. He was the only son of, and a lot of daughters and his dad was very physically abusive. And my dad was not physically abusive, but he would, he would jerk a knot in your butt. But when you, he was helping you with homework, he would get things instantly. And my, my brain didn't really work that way. So he would holler. Um, I was laughing the other day with my mom on the phone because one time I was, I was little, like four or five, and I was learning to read. I wasn't even in school. I think I'd gotten this library book, but I wanted to read so bad. And so I, was, I needed help with the word. And so I went to my dad and he was like, sign it out, sound it out, sound out the word. And uh, sound it out. And I, it was, the word was ocean, which I don't know if you're a phonetics teacher, you can't sound that out. So I was like, I, can, I couldn't sound it out because I was little. Anyways, it was probably a little golden book. So I don't want you to think my dad hit me with a dictionary, but he popped me on the head not hard enough to cause any kind of abuse but let me tell you something i was only four and that 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 caused so much trauma and i want you to know my dad loved me so it wasn't he just wasn't thinking you know that he was frustrated he'd been at work all day he was exasperated enemy spirit oh i'm tired i don't know how to he was unprepared to teach a child how to read he knew how to read but you know sounded out he quit school when he was 12 and ran away from home because his dad was a child molester and a raper and everything else so he ran away from home so he didn't have all these skills so I want, you know, not to take away from this, my dad was some abusive man because he wasn't. But the Lord showed me that when that happened, I suddenly, you know, I had really gripped onto this. That was a destructive learning environment. And then coincidentally enough, the very next year and the next year, because we were in the military, I got two different teachers that were very, like, rough. Grab you, be rough. And so, and I was a very mild child. It was smaller. I was a preemie. So I wasn't a very big person. And so, and I'm not... Anyone that knows me will tell you I'm not really aggressive. So, like, I tend to shy away from that. So, several years in a row, I was in destructive learning environments. And the Lord had shown me that that was one thing he really had to deliver me from. Because I only saw the Father as this, like, pop you in the head. You're not doing right. And so, my Christian walk was more like, don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do that. And then you're fine. More so than a relationship and obedience out of love. It was more like, I don't want to get hit with the book. Does that kind of make sense? And so every single one of us, the first thing I want you to, you know, another thing, the second thing I want you to take from this is your relationship with your father is going to be very reflective of your relationship with Christ. What you're going to put on the father. It's not reflective because God is loving and kind and forgiving and he works everything to our good and he's amazing and 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 our father's not all no father can be like that they're not god and so of course they have failings we have failings so that's just one thing so that was something it could add stress because later in life i i, I was trained and I, and I and god made sure that i had the gifts and talents i needed to do my job but that was still an undercurrent you know when people would come up against me and the lord has shown me too that the enemy has sometimes with other people they will think that I don't know what they're saying. So they'll, they'll be like, well, let me explain it to you, even though I do understand what they're saying. And then it, it would create that spirit of, oh, this person thinks I'm stupid. They think I can't understand. So I would react in frustration. I used to be so frustrated by that because I would just be like, this is, you know, it was exasperating, but I didn't know that. I just thought, well, that's life. All these things I thought, even though I was a Christian, you just got to live with this. You, you, you're you irritated. You got internal conflict. You're anxious. You're frustrated. You, you're raging at circumstances beyond your control. Well, oh, well, you just got to deal with it. Because that's what the crazy 501c churches taught. The churches teach. Go, you know, a bunch of baloney. So that's what was going on in my life. And um, on December 19th in 2016, my daughter was home for Christmas for about a week. My son was off work. He was in college and at work, working at a shop. And my niece was on a video chat with us that night. And because uh, she had just had a baby six months before and she wasn't going to be able to come home for Christmas, even though I raised her as my daughter. She is my niece. I, uh, Nina is biologically my sister's daughter, but I raised her as my daughter. We, she couldn't come home, so we were all video chatting. It was a great time. It was about 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. I want you to know within 10 minutes, within 10 minutes, after everyone had said goodnight, went in their room, the enemy came against my house. And I want you to understand that it's, it's very hard for people to receive this, even though it's been washed. So I'll explain to you what happened, and then I'm going to tell you what God showed me. And it, it took a while for me to completely understand it. 
my son went into his room, opened up a Christmas gift that he and I bought for his son or for his dad, loaded it and shot and killed my daughter and was intending to kill my husband and myself and then himself. Now, this is a little boy who's never struck anyone, was uh, graduated high school early, was in college at 16, had good grades, um, had a job. He had two different jobs. Both bosses loved him. He was the sweetest kid. And so this came as quite a shock to everyone. It, my family included. We were just, we didn't, no one understood. It literally. The interesting thing is about five weeks before this happened, my sister had a message from the Lord that said, there will be bloodshed in your family about five weeks before it. So of course, <clears throat> this happens. The first three years of it is court, um, you know, psychological evaluations, interviews, officer interviews. I mean, it's just obviously when something happens like this, there was a huge amount. And, and I could not grasp, like, one, the district attorney lied. The police officers didn't take a report. I mean, it was so insane that it took at least a year for me to understand the enemy was actively working against me. And when I say the enemy, I mean Satan, because Satan is always working against God's people. God didn't plan for all these things for us, but he... I mean, for the world to be such a show that it is, such a mess. And when I say that, I don't want people to think that I'm saying God's not omnipotent. I'm saying when he originally designed the earth, Adam and Eve were being be in the garden with him, not the prince of the air running things. But keep in mind, God uses everything for good, and there's a story there, too, of why he does that. But here I was as his child. So it took at least a year before I even, I mean, obviously I was crying. I don't think I even prayed the first six months. I was that exasperated because I was just like, there's no way. How did this, I don't. It's impossible. And if you've ever had a quiet, sweet kid, if I, I, all my children are, um, my older and my younger are very quiet and sweet. And my middle one is super sweet and boisterous and friendly. But I didn't have any rowdy kids. Like none of my kids ever got in trouble at school. They never, my kids, I had the normal teenage girl stuff where they argued with you, marijuana, whatever. But I just didn't have, my kids were not naughty. They've just, or I don't want to even use the word naughty. Like they really didn't give me a lot of stress. Like Sonny had always done his homework. I, this was came so far out of left field you guys you don't know like it was left field so the next subsequent two and a half years was a nightmare of courts the district attorney um the judge the officers the jail the treatment of my son at the jail i mean you, it was just it, it, it was so dark and so terrible I, it would take three hours to go into it so at some point about maybe two years into it you know, I really was just arguing with God. I was like, why? You know, like, I, I want an answer. Have you ever done that? Like, like I'm not leaving until I get an answer. Because in my mind, I'm thinking, generally good person. I give to charity. I don't hurt other people. I understand your law. You know, I was thinking, like, you know, the Ten Commandments, that's the law. Um, I felt like I, I won't say I followed all of them. Obviously, I worked in sales, so lying, definitely. Uh, honor God and make him first. I definitely was failing at that one and that's the f most important one but I couldn't see that like that and I'm telling you Christians all over the world can't see that they're doing it. That's why I'm making this video because you think you're honoring God you think you're putting him first because the world has told you you are but you're not. So it took a while for God to come back and like start speaking to my heart. I mean it really did like he was saying nothing. It's like crickets would beg I would cry you know I'd get on my knees I I, I was enraged I mean I, I I was enraged because I felt like I did not deserve this like how your word says that the enemy comes against us like a flood and you'll raise a standard in our heart I mean I was throwing his word back at him I was that ticked I, I, I just couldn't believe it I could understand like if I had seen the signs or there were some kind of signs or something there was nothing and even our closest family and friends were just stumped. It, like how could this be? You know, maybe if he had had behavior problems, maybe if they had fought. Oh, here's the other interesting thing. She, Ashley was eight years old when Sonny was born, and she had begged for a brother for years and years and years. But when I had her, I was told I couldn't have any more. So Sonny was a surprise, and she was delighted. She begged for a sibling. You know, I mean, she had Nina, but she really, she wanted another sibling. She would have wanted ten of them. So how interesting. And they were close. She loved Sonny, and Sonny loved her. They all three, all my kids loved each other. Nina and Sonny were a little closer in age, so they probably teased each other more when they were little. 
but Ashley was a lot older. So if you ever get an older child and a smaller child that's born, they're, they're almost like only children. And so she really loved him as a baby brother. So this was exasperating. I was, I just couldn't understand. So I mean, I was going to God and just, you know, hollering, screaming, crying, whatever. And slowly the Lord started to talk to me. Slowly he started to make me understand, but not for a whole year, year and a half. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to bring it all out. It may, I, it may be in the same, in the right order of the way it was taught. It may not be. I am stepping out in faith, faith and trusting the Holy Spirit to clarify this message and to send it straight into your heart. That's what I'm trusting. So, it, you know, it, it shouldn't be discombobulated by the power of Christ. And that's what I speak in Jesus' holy name. Pretty, it wasn't long uh, into that year, about a year into it, that the Lord started speaking to me about um, showing me that at that, that time in my life, was he the center of my life? Was I keeping the Sabbath? You know, was I honoring him above all things? Was I not lying? You know, I worked in sales. I think we all lie. We're told it's okay. You know, even when we say like to me, oh, I can't come out tonight because of this. You know, one key thing the Lord taught me was don't lie, just don't answer. She said, I can't give an answer right now. You know, but it becomes a habit to lie. So definitely a liar. Um, isn't this terrible? I'm trying to think of the other commandments. A uh, coveting, don't covet what your neighbor has. I don't, I, I definitely think we don't think we're coveting when we want the newer thing or we want this thing or want that thing. But I think we're often coveting because the Bible says, be content with such things as you have. So he was really, you know, like, this is coming at me, all this stuff. Not one day. I want you to understand how Jesus Christ is. He doesn't just show up, you know, the Holy Spirit's such a gentleman, and say, oh, by the way, you're guilty of blah, 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 blah. No. It doesn't work like that. He's such a gentleman. He really wants us to come to him, talk to him, you know, and I, I wasn't getting an answer. So I was getting more exasperated. I felt, let me rephrase that. I felt like I wasn't getting an answer. I probably was, and it was probably something that I didn't want to hear. So I was like, I don't hear that. But, if, but thank God, God opened my heart to hear what he was saying. He was showing me like all the folly in my life and what it had, what it had, had what it had related to. So sorry. I thought I'd turn down the volume on that. This is so important. I apologize. I'm going to go ahead and turn down the volume on this. You guys forgive me. Because it probably will ring again. Oh, sorry. you think I'd be able to do this easily. Okay. So, I, you know, I, I consider myself a pretty middle-of-the-road Christian. I didn't feel like I was in so much sin, you know, that, that, that this kind of thing could happen. Uh, really, and I was not glorifying God. I did not want to read the word at that time. You know, it says rejoice in your sufferings, glorify God. You know, you can imagine at that point, I was like, I am not. What? You know, like, what is this glorify God? Because what do you mean? Like, what, what are you talking about, Lord? Look at this mess. You know, my son is small. He was a very small, even at that time. He's probably never been over 5 foot 10, 130 pounds. He, they sent him to prison. You know, with like big dudes. I mean, and he was getting beat up and getting robbed, among other things. I mean, it, oh, at, at that time, Nina was on heroin. Ashley was gone. My husband had to take over our company because I just completely was like, well, I'm out. I'm not going to deal with life. I'm, I'm going to quit. You know, I mean, this is all that's going on. And I'm, I'm yelling at God, like, why? What did I, what do I, what did I do? What did we, why do we're, what? Because I knew that this came from darkness. You know, I knew this was not something birthed in the home. Not that we had a perfect home, but I knew, you know, that my children hadn't been raised kind of like in a way that this was, I, I just knew, you know, you know what you know. And so I, w I kept calling to him. And, and so this is, I come to this part of the message because I want you guys, God's so good. This is what he showed me. And, it, and it's so, and first of all, one of the first things he showed me was that he chastens those he loves. And he was chastening me because what I was saying with my mouth, I'm a Christian, was not reflective in my behavior. Was God first? Nope. Was I coveting? Definitely. Because if I wouldn't have been working the hours I was or doing the things that I was doing unless I was coveting. Um, you know, was I guilty? I'm trying to think. I, I can't even remember all the commandments, but I'm sure I was guilty of every one of them. I'm Adultery, no, but trying to think of anything else. Definitely, I'm sure. We're all sinners. We're all sinners. And if we say we're not, we're, we lie and we deceive ourselves. So, you know, I don't need to go through the list. But God was showing me that this had occurred because the reason how the enemy was able to come up against, do you remember in the scriptures, um, God tells his people all the time, you know, like, keep your covenant with me and I'll protect you. Well, the church sometimes teaches like, well, oh, will you receive Jesus Christ? So that's your covering. Yes, Jesus Christ is our covering. 
but it doesn't excuse us from the penalty of our sin or not keeping covenant with God. And I was not keeping covenant with God. That's the truth. Now, a lot of Christians are going to get offended and they'll be like, I go to church on Sunday and um, I have Bible study. And so I am, you know, I don't, I, I, I'm not being corrected by the death of a child or a tragedy or something they can't overcome. It's up to you if you want to receive whether you're being corrected or not. I'm trying to explain to you that God corrects those he loves. And he came in my life and corrected me in a big way. He was like, really? Oh, you're a Christian and you want a covenant with me. You say you're covenant, co you have a, you're in covenant with me. Show me where you're in covenant with me. And I wasn't. I mean, the truth be told, I was not in covenant with God. Matter of fact, I, I have to ask, was I even a Christian? Looking back on it now, because now I don't, you know, I don't move forward without his saying. I'm walking in joy. I'm walking in peace. I can laugh, you know, and I can have joy. And I can look back because I know God washed it. You know, and of course, you're, you might ask yourself, like, well, how did God wash it? You know, how did God, how did God wash this? How does she know it's washed? Okay, first of all, it wasn't quick and it wasn't easy. It took a while. It took honest searching and asking the questions. But belief, believe that God will wash it. And, and he did. Because even now, you know, he shows me every single day his grace in it. His grace. Every single day he shows me grace in it. And he, and he has had grace. You know, he, he gave a very good... And I, you know, I would hesitate almost to say this in any other video because I may not know who's watching this and I don't want to cause up hurt for someone in case if they have, have um, suffered a tragedy. But, I'm, but the fact remains that God will wash it. So I'm going to go for it. You need to understand something. God's began to show me that his grace in this, even though right when I was complaining about it, like, why did all this happen? It took a year and a half for the Lord to reveal the scripture to me. And I don't have it off the top of my mind. Do you remember though? Jesus goes to Peter. Peter's name used to be Simon before he renamed Peter. He said, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you, but don't worry, I have prayed for you. And if you remember, Peter did get sifted because he, Jesus tells him, like, oh, before, you know, three o'clock, before this, this morning, before three o'clock, I can't remember the time, you're going to deny me three times before the cock crows. That's what it is. And Peter's like, no, I'm not. And then he does. And so, but later Peter became just, you know, one of, you know, he, he was a disciple that had so much power and authority. And it's because Satan asked to sift him and Jesus had prayed for him. As Christians, we don't recognize that we're being sifted because the false church doesn't want you to know that. They don't want you to know that. They want you to continue in your complaint. They want to continue to have silly little... 20 minute preaching where they're not even teaching or preaching anything they're not preaching the word and if you really are in love with christ you'll receive that and if it angers you then be angry then be angry there's nothing i can do if you're angry but i'm telling you right now that we are sifted we are all being sifted by satan and we are all being prayed for by jesus christ and if we trust him he'll bring us through it so having said that about the sifting it was a while before he let me know about the sifting but when I still would go back to him, like, this is so horrible. You know, what a horrible thing. But he would show me his grace. And one such grace, and there were many in it. But let me tell you something. My daughter is about probably five foot two. She used to say she was five foot four. And she probably weighed about 90 pounds. My ex-husband was Asian. So very tiny, petite little Asian. And my mom's tiny. I want you to know that the weapon that was fired on, fired on her was a 44 or a 45 Magnum. And she took, and it was 15 shots because my son had never fired a gun like that. He was completely possessed. He didn't know, and every single round went straight into her. And I want you to know, all the rounds stayed inside her body. There was no major damage. When this happened, my husband and I ran from the living room. I thought that they had gotten firecrackers. It was so near Christmas, I had bought firecrackers for New Year's Eve. I, I, it was a year before I, I, I couldn't, my mind would think firecrackers. I just, that's what I thought. So that's one grace. You know, you have to realize she could have been completely physically, it could have been so much worse. And I want you to know my mother had a lot of peace at my daughter's funeral because she looked at peace. She really did. Her pretty little face looked like she was asleep and just at peace. And my own sister had passed away 15 years prior and she did not she did not die in peace. And her face was very struggled and at her funeral it was very hard at the open casket because people could see the terror and just terrible. And my daughter did not look like that, but she, but she could have. Um, the other saving grace is, and, and this is, you need to understand this. Sometimes people got to go to jail to get their robe and crown. And I couldn't understand this because Sonny had, you know, gone to church as a child. He didn't really believe that the, the, the system 
and the powers that be had done a good job of blindsiding all of our youth. They have a really hard time believing in the goodness of God. They really do because people keep telling them God doesn't exist. And we as Christians are not doing a good enough job to testify and to witness because as Christians, we say we're Christians and then we covet, we gossip, we talk bad about other people. And I know as Christians right now, you're saying, I don't do that. Hey, you do. If you're talking about Trump or you're talking about Biden or you're talking about Kamala Harris, yes, you are. Because those are your brothers and sisters in Christ. Everybody. I know. They don't look like it. They look evil. And, and many of them are. They are working for the devil straight away. But the fact remains that we're told to hold our tongue. And if we're going to glory in anything, we're to glory in Christ. In all of the nations, glorying in elections, glorying in this, glorying in that, uh, vaccines, uh, pandemic, why somebody should wear a mask. You, your attention and your focus is on those things. They're not supposed to be. And I, and, and I will take a moment to give you a word of warning. Very soon, all of the children of God will be sifted. Some people were sifted before so they could come and bring this message to you. I am bringing a message. You are fixing to be sifted. By, you're fixing to be sifted by Satan. Satan's going to come in and attack through a lot of different things. And it's so interesting because my story mirrors this. It was through violence would look like a war in my life because you, you, you wouldn't even believe this. The actual district attorney came out rather than be a, uh, there's really the DA's office is supposed to have families for victims assistance and help. She went after this like a dog with a bone. I mean, she was awful. The, the devil himself sent her the officers. I mean, it was, it, we were not treated well. I mean, we, and I understand, but if you think about it, Alan and I were victims as well. I mean, we were not treated that way at all. And so God, you know, there was a, a lot of bad come out of a lot of bad in it. But, but what I'm saying to you is that God allowed that sifting. And it's so good that he does because it proves the, the genuineness of your faith. You know, it's it's so, it, God's just, he's that way. And I want to get this piece of paper because I don't want to miss. I probably should have broke down every single scripture. But to be honest, I really wanted this to be Holy Spirit led. So I'm hopeful that the Holy Spirit will help me find this scripture because it's for the first time I really understand um, what it means to be sifted, what it means to be a Christian, what it means, you know, so many things of this, what these things mean. Because I really, I don't think we're taught this in the church anymore that we're supposed to, we're supposed to struggle. We're supposed to, we're supposed to have the devil come against us. These things are supposed to happen to us. But the false church is telling us, no, 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 no. You shouldn't have to struggle. You're not you're not supposed to have to fight. You're not supposed to have all these things happen. And you really, really are. Because how else will you prove how else are you going to prove your faith? And I, I want you to understand something. I'm not talking about you don't need to prove your your faith to God. He knows what it is. He allows the sifting to prove your faith to you or your lack thereof because you're either a saint or you ain't that's just it so here's this is this is just such a beautiful scripture this is first peter verses six through a set six through seven in all this you greatly rejoice though now for a little while you may have had to suffer you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold which perishes even though refined by fire may result in praise glory and honor when jesus christ is revealed now you know the church a lot teaches that scripture like when he's revealed when we see him come on the clouds no i'm here to tell you no it's when he's revealed in our life and that satan's sifting us but jesus has been praying for us and he's going to bring us through because the scripture says he's praying for us. It's none of my prayers. Just the belief that his prayers are work. Really receiving it. So one question I would encourage you to ask yourself today. If you're living in anger or frustration. Or you're irritated. Or you're you just something. You're not living in the peace of Christ. I want you to understand something. You're outside his will. And you're in danger of being chastened. If you really are his child. Danger of being sifted. Now I can't say that every single person gets sifted. Because I don't, Jesus didn't say that exactly to me. But I kind of have a suspicion that everyone gets sifted. 
I, I just kind of have a suspicion. It's all in different ways, you know what I'm saying? Because the scripture, it says right there, in all this, you should greatly rejoice. Greatly rejoice because this is going to prove your genuineness of your faith. And let me tell you something. It has, you guys. This this thing for this last four years, you know, we're coming up on, I want to say, today's November. You know, we're within six weeks of the, what, what a lot of people, if they had suffered this tragedy, they would just be thinking, oh, it's going to be the anniversary of my daughter's death. Oh my gosh, this horribleness. You know, that's, that is how the devil wants you to live. He wants you to live in that destructive heart instead of receive. Now, just think about this. The Lord used this to sift me and to prove my faith. There is so much there to save my son. Let me tell you something. Uh, several people in my family came, came truly to Christ and rededicated their life after this. I want to say at least eight people, myself included. So through this tragedy, eight different people rededicated their life to Christ. And, and God really showed us, like, you're not living for me. You don't even acknowledge me. And so a lot of people don't know, like, if you're what I'm calling a middle-of-the-road Christian, and you know who you are, you're, you're not living for Christ. If you are looking at that phone every day in the social media, oh, they haven't picked the president yet, all oh, this pandemic, everybody needs to put on a mask. You are not living in your authority of Christ. I mean, like, you have power over all things. Power over death, power over over the abuse of the enemy. Because I want you guys to understand something. When I see the abuse of the enemy, when this had first began, before I got delivered from it, the first three years, the devil didn't quit stop talking. Oh, Sonny's going to get raped. Oh, they're going to murder Sonny. Oh, my God. Oh, blah, 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 blah. You know, oh, the core. Oh, they're going to send him to prison for life. Oh, this is going to happen. Oh, oh, no. Oh, no. We have schizophrenia. Oh, no. You know, all these things. And the Lord had to allow it all. So I would go to him and be like, what happened? You tell me I want your truth. Because I need you guys to understand something. The system that you're under is a Babylonian system. It's a Canaanite system. It's not your system. When the God says, come out from her, a lot of people think that means like, you know, come out of the country, like come out of America. Because America is Babylon. I'm just letting you know that right now. We are. If you look at the scriptures in Isaiah, look in Jeremiah, look in Revelations, there's no other country that fits but us. Okay, so receive it or don't. But what I'm trying to say to you is that when we're, we are all fixing to be sifted, now, I would love to tell you, like, oh, okay, I already got sifted, so I won't get sifted again. But I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know if I'll be sifted again. But the good news is, I know when this sifting comes, civil war, battles, death, attack. I mean, and I know that there are false prophets telling you guys that's not going to happen. I need you to understand something. The only reason I know that it's going to happen is because the Father told me. Did he talk to me for years and years and years? I don't know. Maybe he was talking to me, but I wasn't really paying attention. I wasn't really earnestly going and seeking. And you know who you are. There are people who are like, well, God didn't tell me that. And it's because you're listening. You don't really want to hear from him. You want to hear from Trump or Biden or what the news says or Fox or the Facebook or the doctor. You don't want to hear from him. How do I know that? Because I didn't want to hear from him. I mean, not. I wasn't consciously like, I don't want to hear from God. But I earnestly wasn't seeking him. I was living my life, working, sending my kids to college. You know, I, I wasn't like, oh, Lord, you know, I'm going to get up every morning and really try to focus and really try. No. Be why? Why was I not? Because I thought that I was a Christian. I thought I was saved. Well, I didn't know. Like, I didn't know anything was wrong. I didn't feel close to God in the way that I think that other people did. But I also thought, well, maybe that's because they're a missionary. Maybe that's because they're a Pentecostal. I don't know. I didn't even really give it a lot of thought. I don't have an explanation for that season in my life because I'm washed of it and clean of it and I don't look back. And, you know, it says in the scripture that I'll give you beauty for ashes. And the scriptures say that I, you know, I hold every tear. And it is true that God does give beauty for ashes. Because let me tell you something. And it's so funny that he says beauty for ashes because my daughter's nickname was Ashes. And he has given beauty for ashes. Let me tell you something. He has verified my faith to me. I'm washed in the blood. And I know no matter what happens, I'm saved and I'm redeemed. I'm telling you, there are a lot of Christians walking around. They think they're redeemed. And there, there might be people arguing and saying, well, they received Jesus, so they're redeemed. Yes, but they haven't been sifted yet. They ain't quite been sifted yet. And you got to get sifted. It's not for him. He knows the level of your faith. He gave it to you. It's for you. So I'm speaking to you, my brothers and sisters, very soon in this country. You will see civil war, destruction, assassinations, and then you will see actual war from other forces on our ground. You will see the implementation of the beast system, the mark of the beast, and the vaccine. You will, if you are not redeemed by Christ and if you don't trust Jesus, you'll be churning in your neighbors. And you are in a definite situation of possibly taking the mark of the beast. How do I know that? Because 2,700 different evangelical preachers 
said that the vaccine is not the mark of the beast. And it's possible that you can't find out for yourself because you are not close with Christ right now because you're living for the world. So you can't hear his truth. It's very simple. It's what Rob Wood said. You're either a saint or you ain't. Before I wasn't. Now I am. Does a saint mean I'm innocent? Nope. It means I'm forgiven. Does a saint mean I'm getting to heaven before you? Nope. It just means I'm forgiven and I know I'm going. And anything that happens between then and between then and and now is no big deal because God's already brought me through. He used this to show me destruction's coming, but I'm going to bring you through. I'm going to bring you through. Okay. And I, that's what I want for you. I want you to be really delivered. Um, I would hear sometimes when I was really struggling with this the last year, I would hear Christians that would give words of encouragement. They'd say, press in. And you know, I'm so literal. I would press in what? Like, press in. What do you mean press in? I don't know what that means. Press in stand you ever heard a christian say then just stand that's another one if you if you have a type of mind like i have both those words what do they mean so i'm going to help you out you know what press in means it means turn around in your heart and keep saying thank you jesus you don't like your husband he's a jerk you know my first husband was a jerk i didn't know at that time to pray and to not react i did not i'm telling you as christians we're not reacting the way we're supposed to if you're a Christian and you've written something ugly about somebody on Facebook, you've said something, or if you're a Christian, you said, well, I forgave that person, but I took them out of my life. That's not real forgiveness. If you're a Christian and you say, oh, I'm a Christian, I'm saved, but then you give, you give life to death and you say, but I have this disease or I have that or this has happened or this tragedy, then you're not living out your truth. You say you're a Christian, but you're not living it. You can live in happiness and joy and rejoice and be completely washed of it. How do I know? Because of what happened to me. And we and I laugh and we joke, you know, because we're over it. I know where my daughter is. I know where my son's going. I know where I'm going. I know where my husband's going. And I know it was a gift. If you have lost a child or lost someone close to you, I want to speak to you right now. That is an opportunity for God to speak to you. He wants to talk to you. He wants you to come to him and let him wash it. A lot of people have a hard time receiving and saying, I, you know, I, this happened to me because I was in sin. And the church doesn't teach that anymore. Even though the Old Testament, New Testament, it shows it all the time. You know, some things are just for the glory of God. The blind man mentioned, you know, that he was blind and the disciples asked Jesus, well, was he born blind because his parents are sinners or he's a sinner? Jesus said, neither for my glory. And in truth, it's all for his glory. But one of the first steps is going to God and getting back in covenant with him. And what does that mean? Not doing the things he told you not to do. Does it mean you're not saved? No, it means you're going to get chastised. If you're really God's child, he's going to chastise you. This was a chastisement. That's what it was. Flat out. Now, I can already hear people who aren't saved saying, well, how is that a chastisement? Because your son ended up in jail and your daughter ended up dead. Well, my daughter's in heaven. And what a lot of people don't realize is three weeks before this happened, her fiance, even my son does not know this. Only myself and my husband know this. Um, Three weeks before my son, this happened, my daughter tried to commit suicide twice because she and her fiancé had broke up. I'd already been out to Colorado twice. So she tried to kill herself twice. And then crazy enough, three weeks later, she's gone. So God's in all things. God is in all things. It says he's in all things, of all things, and all things are held together by him. Not some things, all things. So I know she's with the Father. I know that's where Sonny will be. That's where I'll be. That's where my husband will be. That's where Nina will be. Because my sisters. Because this really shook our family like a core. It shook our friends. But I'm here to tell you, it was just a shaking. It was something the enemy decided to sift us, but Jesus brought us through. So you need to go and look. If you've got some trauma or some tragedy in your life, maybe you're irritated. A lot of Christians think like, well, I'm exasperated because that person's a jerk or this person or that person, but it's not me. I got news for you. If you are not walking in complete joy and happiness and anything's making you anxious, you have not received the fullness of Jesus Christ. And I want to give it to you. Father God, I just bless my brothers and sisters with your complete fullness. Father God, I pray that you give them the understanding of being sifted in the fact that you are praying for us and you bring us through, Father God. And I just pray that you reveal the genuineness of their faith in this season and father god i pray that we press in and i bless them with the pressing in in the mighty name of jesus christ and i cast down any work of the enemy that would stop them from hearing this message and i cast it out and i break all altars of evil in jesus christ's mighty name brothers and sisters very soon you will be facing civil war and real war in our country plus much tragedy 
keep your focus on Jesus. Keep your focus on Jesus. Believe in him. If you're struggling right now, press in. Turn off all the media, all the news, all the YouTube. Turn it all off. Uh, maybe you've got some sewing projects you're doing. I used to I used to teach sewing. Maybe you're a gardener. Stop it. Stop all of it. I'm not kidding. I know that sounds harsh. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, stop. There is nothing more important right now than getting in covenant with God. He is speaking to his people. For those of you who voted, I know this is... I'm just going to go with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's leading. For those of you who voted, I would encourage you to repent of it. You have made a contract with King Cyrus. We're Babylon. You are not to vote as Christians. I know the 501c church tells you to. You're not, you, you're not to vote. You're not to vote. We are not to vote. We are not to make contracts with the prince of the air. The prince of the air runs this world. Our king is in heaven. You vote. You voted for Jesus. You're either a saint or you ain't. I'm telling you, if you voted, go repent. The father's upset about it. He has been calling his children for a while now, a while, to come back into alignment with him, align with the Spirit of God. I can assure you of something. If you will come back into covenant with God and you will press in, and don't quit if you don't hear from him, if you don't hear his voice for 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 10, 12 weeks, 14 weeks, you will hear him when the time is right, but not until your heart's right and you can't get it right. You're going to need to ask him to help you forget. If you're walking around saying, well, you know, those people over there, or those, you are already in danger. You're already in danger. You're already in danger of not loving someone. Remember the Bible says love covers a multitude of sins. You need to ask yourself right now, do I love everybody on this planet? You know how I know this? You know how I know it's true? God used a situation that happened in the jail to teach me something. You know, when I was a, when, when before this happened, I never gave a thought. I mean, I, that's terrible, but I really never gave a, pot, a thought to people in jail. I thought, well, they're in jail because they committed a crime. You know, I didn't believe that they couldn't come out and be rehabilitated, obviously, and I didn't think people should be punished forever, but I mean, I didn't have a huge bit of opinion on the penal system either way, but definitely as a Christian, I wasn't praying for them. There are some Christians that go in and do jailhouse ministry. God bless you. Those are seeds. Then the harvest is happening, so God bless you, but I was not one of those Christians. I, I, I died. I didn't have a heart for it because I didn't have a heart for Jesus because I really wasn't operating with Jesus. Because of the abuse and stuff that Sonny suffered, God has really given me a heart for those men in the jail. And I lift them up all the time because I realize they're under the same. Had I not seen demonic possession in my own house and this evil come against me, I would have no idea that a lot of the people that are in prison, all of them have been oppressed demonically in the suggestion of this Canaanite system, this Babylonian system has, had, because it's a profiteering system. The prince of the air wants everyone under his under him, not hiding out in the shadow of the wings of Almighty, not having a covenant with God. It's been that way since the beginning of time, and it will always be that way. And in the middle of that is just like people that they think they're fine. There's many examples in the Bible where God delivers the Israelites, and then some idol is found in their camp. So a lot of Christians are like, well, I'm not Catholic, and I don't have a little idol. Let me tell you, you got an idol if, you, if you're thinking about Trump. Whatever you think about most all day is your idol. My sister said that one time. It's, it's true. Whatever you think about all day long is your idol. If it's you, if it's the presidency, election, sickness, whatever it is, that's your idol. If you're not thinking about God all day, so that's what we need to be thinking about is, is what are we focusing our attention on. The other thing I want to say is God is good. He delivers his children. He, he is capable. Well, first of all, the work's already finished. And he is capable of speaking to his children. And so, so many people are susceptible to false prophets because they haven't learned to hear the voice of the Lord. And that's because someone told them, well, I, I prayed and then God told me. Well, in fact, a lot of times it's given through thoughts and understanding and those different kind of things. But the, one of the most important things I learned about this whole thing is that we all have idols. Sometimes our own selves are our idols, our hurt. You know, when this all happened, I didn't realize how much hurt I was operating under, like how I spoke to my husband, how I spoke to my child. Just like I would be frustrated and get exasperated with my husband, who is the God's most sweet blessing. I mean, he's definitely is, the, you know, my kingdom spouse. God sent him. But I was so exasperated about everything. I would just snap at him. And none of my behavior was Christ-like, but I couldn't even see it. I was so blinded to what I, because I was under so, and you know, and I know people will be like, well, of course that's expected. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's not expected. God says for us to be content in all things. I know how both to be abased and abound. That's what happened. I was abased. And now I'm abounding. Because of Christ washed it. 
when I see Christians living in frustration when they're they're just so downtrodden they can't let go it's because they won't press in and give it to Christ now what does it mean to give it to Christ let me tell you when the devil would start saying oh they're gonna cut Sonny's throat and kill him and rape him and murder him. you know oh, no Satan God says I know the plans I have for you to prosper to not do you harm okay because people think well then harm happened so God wasn't involved I'm living proof harm definitely happened and a bunch of people got delivered from it and I'm here to tell you that there is a deliverance story inside of you you have a message you everyone is a part of the body of Christ all the part of the body has a message something they need to give and this is the season for us to be sharing with our brothers and sisters for us to be saying things for us to help because you never know your story you have a story and you have a story and you have a story all of you have a story and this is the season to share it because we're fixing to go into the great sifting that's going to happen in our country now of course there's going to be destruction all over the world because it is the end times and i understand that your your spirit the spirit on you wants to argue about it so i'm just going to explain this to you a lot of what you think and feel and say is not you it's the voice that voice you're hearing that's why you need to learn to shut it off you need to turn it off and press in it's pressing in means Jesus I trust you even if that does happen you know even recently you know, I haven't heard from Sonny in three or four days or my niece both you know how crazy well I did hear from Nina right before this started but I was like I haven't heard from either one in four days so right away the devil's like well Sonny's dead and Nina overdosed that's exactly what the devil presented over here and I was like well they both know Jesus, so whatever. Do you see what I'm trying to say to you guys? The devil has no hold anymore because God's washed it. He's washed it. It's a genuine faith. I trust him no matter what. I'm not holding on to people so much. If you're holding on to somebody and you want them to change, you know, maybe somebody's using drugs, you have a drug addict, alcoholic in your life, an abuser, whatever, and you're just like, I'm going to try to change them. Stop it. You can't change them. You just work on you. Get your covenant right with God. Because let me tell you something, when we are really walking out our covenant with Christ, nobody can touch us. Let me tell you something, I know that. Like I absolutely know Christ has made me bulletproof through this. The devil cannot come against me. And I think it's so funny that he used the word bulletproof. Because he has. It doesn't matter what anybody says, whatever they think. It doesn't matter. The government doesn't care if they drag me away. I don't care. Because I know Christ and it will be for his glory and my good. Everything that's ever happened in my life has been for my good. In his glory and if you can't say that I suggest you keep pressing in until he reveals it to you because he will because he's good because this you are having a an experience a human experience you are an eternal being you will either either eternally go to hell or heaven depending on whether or not you receive Christ you no one goes to the Father who's in heaven but through Jesus Christ so that's the reality so when we get we're still holding on to hurts that happen in this world I just want you to think about this you're an eternal being that means you live forever when you receive Christ or you live forever in hell if you don't receive Christ and you may possibly make it to 100 years on this planet some people are holding on to stuff that happened to them either recently or 20 or 30 years ago when they're gonna live forever does that make sense to you Does that make sense to you like you're gonna live forever you've been told that you promised that is it possible you don't believe the promise if you're really worried about what happened five years ago ten years ago you haven't gone to the father it's not washed when I've met people that are still living in grief for 30 years later, but swear up and down they're a Christian. How can you be living in grief? It says rejoice in all things. It says greatly rejoice. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit said reread it. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief. You may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Yeah, that's what happened. These have come, these trials, these sufferings, these tribulations, these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. It's not time about when he's revealed in the heavens, which is going to be glorious. It's time about when he's revealed that he's been holding us up the whole time. Everything's been a test and he's brought us through to rejoice. Does that make sense? If you are a member of a church, one of these false church, false teachers that are just giving you baloney, every, stop. Go and read the Bible. Sit down, turn on some soft music, do it every day, do it twice a day, do it three times a day. If you have anything else in your life that you think could be speaking louder, no, I'm going to rephrase that. Let me take that back. Not take it back, I want to rephrase it. You do have things in your life that are speaking louder. How do I know that? Because I've been washed of this. I had things in my life that were speaking louder than God. It wasn't that I couldn't hear God. I, I couldn't hear him over the din because I wouldn't shut those things down. Your 
mine is territory and you need to decide who's going to be in charge of that territory. Are you going to let Satan run around in his playground and speak all kind of thoughts? Oh, I can't stand my mother-in-law. I don't like this. Oh, so-and-so died. Oh, I'm sick. I have cancer. Oh, the Dane Biden might win. Oh, my God. Trump might get back in. Oh, we're going to have a civil war. All oh, the Chinese and the Russians are coming. You know, what are you doing? Do, are you standing on Christ? You standing on Christ? You know, many of you, you're being told, like, oh, you better make sure, you know, you need to pray and you need to vote so that we get Trump in there. Does that sound like praying for God's will? You don't need to involve yourself in this. The Father's asking you to step back because in a little while, you're going to see the glory of God on people who have, God has pulled back from this. And you're fixing to see great destruction and your test, your faith is going to be tested. It's going to be tested. Will you turn in your neighbor? Will you report? Will you, will, you, will you help force people to go be vaccinated? Will you keep insisting people wear face masks even though you're a Christian and you know if you've received Christ, nothing in this world, all things are under his feet, including illness. Do you see what's happened with the church? They're telling you guys, science trumps God. Science trumps the voice of God. Science trumps the scriptures that say all things are under his feet. He grew people's hands. You think he's worried about coronavirus? Coronavirus is a plague. And it's not for you if you are a child of God. Coronavirus is a plague. We are under judgment in our country. How do I know this? Because I just faced judgment in my home. And I was rightfully judged and sifted. Everything that God said about me was true. It was self-righteous. I didn't have him first in my life. I was covetous. You know, I was dishonest. I worked in sales, so of course it was a liar. You know, hello. I mean, just the list goes on and on, but I thought I was a pretty good Christian. Nope. See, the thing is, a lot of people are like, I, I'm, I'm pretty obedient to God, and I'm not, I'm not evil. No, he wants us to be obedient. He says if we love him, we'll follow our commandments. But we're caught in this Babylonian system, Babylonian system where we think sarcasm and hate, and we are picking up the habits of the people that live in this system that aren't saved. And we're supposed to be set apart and be different where we smile, we love, we are not doing these things. So the people that are lost will come to us. Just think about it. If you claim Christ, but then you're doing all these things. Do you think somebody who's lost that doesn't know Jesus is going to want to come over to you? No, oh, that's how, that's what God showed me. I was claiming Christianity, but I can't imagine me helping any lost person get to heaven or to, go, to know Christ, to receive Christ. Because I didn't know him. I just claimed his name. But thank God, once you claim his name and you and all who call on him will be saved, you will be sifted and he will come in and set you right. But him setting you right, the genuineness of your faith is for you. So you know how much faith you have. That way when you face adversity, when you face the devil, when you face these challenges, you know who's helping you overcome. You know who has already overcome. Does this make sense? I just pray in Jesus' mighty name that you really receive this because I want you to know that the devil was slinging me around for years about all of this, and he can't touch me now. God has made me bulletproof through the test. Start by making a list of everything you've overcome in your life. Make a list, and then praise God for it. Because I think you're going to be surprised how many times he brought you through. And then make a list of things you're not delivered from, and bring them straight to the throne and ask God. If you need to fast, fast. Now, I will say this. God usually calls people to fast and interestingly enough, I don't really ever feel like the Lord's call. He only ever called me to one fast, and it was this summer. It was a Daniel fast. It wasn't a complete uneating fast, which I think is so funny because, of course, my husband has, my, my, my family is all smaller and thin. So, like, anytime we fast, you know, I know that God, I know one time I didn't eat for 25 days, and I didn't die, and I was fine. So, I know for a fact that you can fast 40, 50, 60 a year. Brahmins, you know, people, people fast for a year. I'm just talking about like all day. If you can't make, I know right away some people are like, well, I have low blood sugar. They're Christian. I have low blood sugar. I might die. Do you believe in God or not? Do you believe in the power of the living God? If you do, go and ask him, Lord, do you want me? I want to be delivered because we know that some spirits don't come out but for fasting. The Bible says so. What if you think you don't have a spirit on you? What if you're like, I'm not, I don't even have a spirit? <sighs> then I'll just say this. I know that that sifting's coming. Okay, it's coming. And we all are susceptible to the spirits because this world's the prince of the air and we have to keep it right and tight. We have to keep our mind locked. Trust me. Oh, that devil was like, kill yourself. That devil's like, 
you know, you just everything. Like I, 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 I now because God's washed me of it. It's, he had he had said in a prophetic word. Somebody had told me when you're delivered from all this, you won't even hardly remember the pain. You won't really remember. And it's true because I try to think back. I was hard to make this list because he has delivered me. But I mean, I remember one time I cried for a week straight. My eyes were swole shut. My poor husband who loves me and, you know, is a good man and a God fearing man and a Christian and just is an all around wonderful person. He had to watch all this, hear his daughter shot by his son, his wife's falling apart, you know, and talk about a testimony for him because he stayed on his knees and God delivered it. Because it was not because of me praying, you know, but other people stayed on their knees. Because I'm telling you right now, the first 16 months, I was like, I'm not talking to you. Because I don't even know what you, what is going on here. Because how did this happen? I'm a Christian. How did this happen? Because I was a Christian in name only. So I'm, I mean, encourage you, brothers and sisters. You don't want to be a Christian in name only. Because that's like a piece of paper that falls down. You don't want to be like that. Remember it says in the scriptures, I think it's in James, like tossed about with every doctrine, every wind of doctrine. That's because you're not solidified in your faith. And the only way to do that is to go to Christ and ask him to help you. The other way it occurs is through sifting when these things that are starting to happen are going to come on the planet. Now, I know there's going to be people that are listening to this and be like, that's not going to happen. And, and, and to them, I just say, you know, I, all I can do is do as I'm called, share what I'm told to share, and, and do the best that I can with the things that God gave me to try to convince you. Um, and if you don't believe it, I have, I've done my part. Your blood's not on my hands. See, I don't want any blood on my hands. Because that's what the scriptures say. You know, if you if you see the danger coming and you don't blow the horn as a watchman, you know, if you're watching and you you saw, and of course I lived it, of course I saw it, you know, close up view, bird's eye view, and you don't warn others, your blood's their blood will be on your hands. And God will call for it. And like at the end of the day, at judgment, your blood will be on my hands if I don't share this with you. But if I do share it with you and you choose to dismiss it, then that of course that's on you. That's on you what you take to the throne. Take it to the Father. Share it with other people. If you know someone who's lost their child or who has a major, anything, anything that I listed there, someone who's struggling and hasn't been delivered, if you know anyone who's not been delivered, who claims Christ, they are to be delivered. We're not to live in that and we don't have to. We're to break those altars by the power of Jesus Christ. And we do that through prayer and supplication, reading the word. I know, I already, you're going to be like, I don't want to read the word. I remember, I didn't want to read the word for six months. And my sister, she would just send me like the digital Bible where you could listen to it. And sometimes, to be honest, I'd get so mad because I'd hear a word and I would just throw the tablet. I'd just throw it. I don't want to listen to this. I mean, can you imagine? And because I was, I just really felt righteous, self-righteous. And why did this happen to me? I was so grateful it happened. I know that sounds so crazy, but I'm so grateful because... For the first time ever, I really know my Savior. I can hear from God. I know what He's saying. He speaks into my heart. I don't have to worry about this prophet said that or that person said this. I hear Him for myself. And it's beautiful, brothers and sisters. It really is. And I didn't really ever think it could happen because of everything that was going through. You know, the devil really tried to tell me, you're not God's child because look at your life. And in fact, I was God's child because He would have never allowed for me to be sifted if I wasn't. So a lot of what you're going through is just to prove your own faith, the genuineness of your own faith. Uh, most gracious Heavenly Father, I, I pray in Jesus' mighty name that you bless my brothers and sisters in this hour and in the coming hours. And Father God, I just pray a mighty wind of your Holy Spirit will pour out on our nation and on, our, on my brothers and sisters. And Father God, that you will give them strength in this hour as they face the sifting that we all go through. Father God, I pray and I ask forgiveness for those of my brothers and sisters who have voted and made ties with King Cyrus inside the Babylonian system. And I pray by Jesus' mighty name, Father God, that that you forgive them and we repent corporately as a body and that we move forward repenting of it and we continue to keep our eyes focused on you and keep our hearts focused on you and we, we, we make sure that you're our everything. Father God, I pray in this hour that you remind my brothers and sisters how much you love them and that you show them that they are, they are not to live in defeat, that you help them to walk in victory as you've given to me. Father, your word says that you're no discerner of men. What you do for one, you'll do for other. And so, Father God, I pray for all the people within the sound of my voice that you will do for them what you did for me, that you will deliver them in Jesus' mighty name, and that they will walk the streets of gold, and they will claim God, and they will say, El Olam, the Father of everything, God of the universe that they will call on you, that they will not deny the name of Jesus Christ. Father God, I pray that you place the name of Jesus Christ on their tongue and that they will remember no matter what tribulations, what trials they face, be they be beheaded, be they called to be a tribulation saint, that they will not deny, deny the name 
of Jesus Christ, their Savior. They will not deny the name that saves them, for all things are under his feet. I pray these things in your mighty, precious name, Lord. And I thank you, Father. I thank you for these battles and these struggles. Thank you, Jesus. I hope this makes sense. And I hope this helps this one part of the Bible that says, Rejoice in your sufferings. Count it all joy. I'm hopeful that this brings the Bible alive for that. I count it all joy. So many people got delivered from this. So many people got saved. So many people at the jail are getting delivered. You know, my, my family prays so much for them. Um, it has really just put us on a new path and a new life. And it's a new season, you know, and, it, and none of it could have happened. You know, several years ago, I thought, okay, my future is just this. This will always, no, God wants to wash it. He wants to get our garments clean, wool, white as snow. That's what he's doing right now. Because a lot of his children got dirty garments on. They're gossiping about other people, talking ugly. They're making snide comments. You know, if you're queen or king of the snide and you're posting things on Facebook and they're, and they're about other people, and even if they're true, even if you've confirmed the veracity of the claim, it's still gossip and you're still talking about other people. And God tells us not to do it. Isn't it interesting? There's a whole free social media platform, Twitter, Instagram, and social media, where all you can do all day long is talk about other people and spread gossip and rumor. An innuendo. Weird, huh? And all the Christians are signed up for it. Now, I'm not saying that you can't use the social media platform for good. I'm just asking each of us to examine ourselves and find out if we really are in the faith. Because we're fixing to get sifted. And it's, I think it would be better to go into the sifting, know it's happening, and knowing that God's using it to, to reveal your own faith, the genuineness. I'm not going to say God's wrong because I went into mine and didn't know that. I'm just saying... I hope this helps you as you go into it. Be thinking Jesus. If they ask you to deny his name, don't. Because the Bible tells us at some point the tribulation saints will be asked to deny Christ or they'll lose their head. And I just want to point out, you know, first time I ever really started to understand that prophecy, I was like, whoa, look, everyone's going to get their head cut off. But I thought, how gracious of God. That's quick. It's quick and easy. And that minute that your head comes off, then you go to glory. So I encourage you, if you're not a believer, um, I encourage you, don't take the mark of the beast. Do not take that vaccine. And as Christians, I know that some of you think you should take the shot. I just want to throw this last idea at you. If you're a believer in Christ, and if you're a Christian, and you know God is all, and he created the world and everything in it, he's in all things, and all things are held together by him, do you really want me to believe that there's a virus or bacteria and that we need to be vaccinated from early childhood on? Because God messed up the body and he didn't know about the viruses and the bacteria. No. We have a CDC. We've always had it. And we've always had scientists. And they create bacteria. And God allows them. Because a lot of times it's for plagues and pestilence. Coronavirus is a plague. It's a plague. It's listed in the Bible in the end times. We're in the end times. If you're a Christian and you can't receive that that's a plague, you need to understand. You, you're not. You're, if, go back and read Exodus. And read with the Israelites. It's the Egyptians who got the plague. Those that were not had covenant with God, not you. Now, some people are going to see this video and be mad and say, well, my friend died and they're a Christian and they had coronavirus. Okay, first of all, we don't know if they actually had coronavirus because the powers that be lie. Number two, you don't know who's in covenant with God. I just told you that I was living a pretty decent life and I was not in covenant with God. I just told you that and look what happened with me. Okay? Many people think they're walking in covenant with God and they're not. They're sharing false preachers. False teachers, false music from the likes of Hillsong and Bethel, you know, and then, they're, then they want to claim Christ, but you don't want to be in covenant. It's the same thing that happened with the, the Israelites. Oh, we want you to go in there, Gideon, get us and go have the fight. <coughs> Let's go over here and take this land. And then every time they wouldn't win a battle, God would go to one of the prophets, go to one of the guys in charge and be like, oh, somebody in the camp, somebody in the camp has an idol. Somebody in our camp. God's people have idols. Not just somebody, a bunch of us. I was one. I'm grateful that I was one and, and the destruction that hit the group was my small group. I'm so grateful it didn't get everyone. You know, because no one wants to be accountable. Like David, when he had sinned and did the, you know, he took the census, God said to pick three things. And one of the things, God sent down fire and like 70,000 people burned up that were Israelites. But even though David's the one that was like, I'm going to count all up. Do you see? We need to be very mindful that God is exactly who he says he is. He's the God of all. And when he, we are in covenant with him, nothing can touch us. I literally mean that. I mean it. Nothing. 
Not only that, we'll be healed from sickness, from lupus. You can be healed. It just depends on if you really think so or if you think what the doctor said, if you think what the scientist said. Because you'll hear people say, oh, Christians, they don't think they can get this or that. They're the ones losing out. And you guys are letting them, we're letting them steal our thunder. If they don't want to believe, they don't got to believe. Remember the Israelites? The Israelites believed. There were other people in the land that did not believe in God. But you bet, you bet, when they seen the Israelites coming, they knew that their God went before them as a pillar and as a fire and smoke. They were scared of the Israelites. They were, because they knew they were not going to touch the Israelites because if God put it down, unless God allowed them to be sifted because they were sinning. That's what's coming to America. We're under great judgment. Please receive this in the name of Jesus Christ. Please understand that you're fixing to be sifted. And please understand it's to prove the genuineness of your faith. So trust Jesus in it. I, I, you might holler at him. I'm not going to say don't because I did. I was like called out and screamed out. And I assume, you know, that's what you got to do too. Whatever you got to do, I promise you get on your knees. If you can't get on your knees, get on your knees. If you can't get on, your, get on your knees. Lay down flat on the floor. I'm not talking about in a chair. Prostrate yourself. Call out to the God of all. And he will help clarify this for you. He will speak. I, I want you to understand. It doesn't mean in, you know if you get off here and you're like, I'm going to go ask God about this and he's going to speak. Unless you have a working relationship with the Holy Spirit, it's very possible you won't hear this. But don't quit. Don't give up. The reason you're not hearing from right off is because you're not making him the center of your life. You know, if you had somebody and they only called on you occasion, you wouldn't just drop everything to get their phone call. Okay, it's kind of like that. Like you need to be in covenant with him first. Like get in covenant. If you're not in covenant, ask him. Or maybe something happened big to prove you weren't in covenant like me. Like what happened with me was like, you're not in covenant and quit calling yourself my name or be, if you're going to call yourself my name, then be that by my power because you are that. I said you're that. Remember, we're predestinated. He says we are and he will sift us up and shake us up and he's even going to spit some people out of his mouth for being lukewarm. So if you are lukewarm, today is the day to get hot, hot, hot for Jesus. If you're cold for Jesus and you had never met Jesus, your, champ, your time's coming. Christ is going to reveal himself to everybody. Brothers and sisters, I hope this message wasn't too long. I will be back on later with some other quick prophetic words and messages that the Father gave me. But I first wanted to give this message because I did get asked by someone like, well, well, how did you get these prophetic words? And it's because God brought me through this. And it's why I can speak on these things because I'm clean to them. Okay, because like he he washed it, not me. It's not anything that I did. He washed it. And so he's given that's part of my calling is to identify the lukewarm church and the foolish virgins. Okay, and I know that a lot of people are like, oh, I'm not probably one of those foolish virgins. I have news for you. I did not think I was. And noted, neither did anyone around me because most of my friends, family, well, everyone that I knew, they were like, I cannot believe this happened to you. That was what they kept saying because my righteousness was on the outside. It looked like I was decent, but I wasn't in covenant with God. Make sense? So just take it to the Father in prayer. Um, I love you all with an everlasting love. I know that's hard to receive if, if maybe you're not saved or maybe you're working from a position of you aren't loved or you feel unloved. So I just really want to say that I do love you and I'm praying for you. Um, I, lift, I lift you up. And I just intercede on your behalf with the Father that he will show you his truth and he will reveal his glory. Because I don't want you to ever forget, everything's for his goodness. I am proof. What happened to me is proof. He used it for my good, my family's good, and his glory. So I glorify the name of Jesus Christ always and in all ways. Um, have a great rest of the day. If you're watching this in the morning, good morning. Go praise God. If it's the middle of the day, go praise God. If it's at night, go praise God. Everything's going to work out. Everything's going to be okay when we are in covenant with Christ. I love you, brothers and sisters. Have a great rest of the day.